Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala wa ba'd We finished last time with Surat Al-Qari'a, the striker, which is one of the names of the Day of Judgment. And tonight we are going to start with Surat At-Takathur, which is Surah number 102 out of 112. Um, Surat At-Takathur is a Mecca Surah. Uh, it came, as it is said in the uh, Takathir, on the healing of two Qurashite groups, both from Quraysh Sam and something else, Abdin Abdin Manaf. No, Surah Al-Takathur, Surah 102. 102. No, no. Two, two clans from the tribe of Quraysh were kind of like bragging about what they have from their side of the family, their ancestry, how many people were fighters, how many people were merchants, how many people were this, how many people had business, how many servants they had on their side of the clan. And this surah came to silence all types of bragging that people use because of what they pile up from this life. To effectively say that whatever you pile, no matter how much it may be, it's not worth bragging <laughs> because this whole life is worth nothing. The only thing that has value in this life is whatever gives you credit in the hereafter. I mean, yeah. That's all what has value. Even to the point that the Prophet وسلم, says, everything in this life is cursed except whatever has to do with Allah, with His remembrance, with following His guidance, or worshipping Him, or praising Him, or guiding others to see the path He set forth. That's all what has value. But despite all what we say, we still love money. We love gold and silvers and the green papers, the yellow papers, the red papers, whatever the currency color is, we love it. Why? Why do we love money? Because money leads to power. And power gives you more freedom than those who don't have power. Power gives you control. But why do people seek power by paying money? Because power gives you money more than the money you had before the power. If and because all systems set by humans are corrupt, people love power. But in the days of the Prophet وسلم, people did not seek power. People were drafted to lead and they would push it back and say, no, I cannot. <laughs> because they saw this not as a position of power, but as a position of responsibility. So they were not bragging that my sons are leaders or fighters. No, they would not brag about this. And I'm talking about Muslims, I'm not talking about the pre-Islamic era. I'm talking about the companions of the Prophet and the following generation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the surah title or the surah name, I don't like to call it title because the title is only when the matter coming beneath is only related to the title. Like a title of a book because I author it, I want it to be about this. Right? So I put this as a title. But this is not an authored book that is written by a human. It is made by Allah SWT. How is it named? The Surah? Allah SWT gives names to the Surah 
to Jibreel, who gives the name to Muhammad وسلم, who gives the name to the scribes who were recording the Quran and memorizing the Surah. And he only used the names of the Surah as something that is highlighted in a way or another. It doesn't have to be the most significant subject. Like, for example, Surah Al-Nahl is not about Nah, it's not about bees. Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, is not about the cow. Right? So, the naming of the Surah, I'm not going to say titling, but the naming of the Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picks something that makes the Surah distinguished in a way or another. That's all. So the Prophet وسلم, used to tell the scribes, put this set of ayat, after that ayah, it comes in the surah in which the cow is mentioned. He wouldn't call it Surah Al-Baqarah. It was called later Surah Al-Baqarah. But he said the surah in which the cow is mentioned. And because it's a long surah, so people, every time he says the name, which is the surah in which the cow is mentioned, so they named it Surah Al-Baqarah, and so on and so forth. Okay. In a short surah though, like Surah Al-Nasr, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ It's obvious that this is a focused subject at the same time while it is a name. Surah Al-Takathur is really about the takathur but it does not change the pattern. The pattern stays to be the same. So it starts off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-Rajim Al-Hakumu al-Takathur See, in short surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes very directly. From the beginning, you have a sense of what the surah is about or what the highlight in the surah is about. So in surah uh, al-Tariq, it is about al-Tariq but not exclusively, it has other subjects as well. Okay? Surah Al-Fajr is not about Fajr prayer, even though Allah swears by Al-Fajr. But the Surah is not about Al-Fajr, so it's not a title. So in some very few cases, the title and the name are the same. And sometimes they are totally separate. Okay? Uh, so, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur, Al-Ha from Laha Yalhu wa Al-Ha, which means to distract. And Lahu is also derived from the same thing, which is to play, to amuse yourself, to enjoy yourself. Lahu, which is when you sit down with your kids and you're having fun, that's Lahu. Okay? But there is lahu that is halal, and there is lahu that is haram. It's not possible to categorize it as halal. Like, for example, singing by a woman in the presence of men. Singing itself is not a problem. It's not haram. But singing for a woman in front of men there is lots of luring and attraction and voice manipulation which can lure a lot of people. So from that end, a woman singing in the middle of women is supposed to be fully halal, right? But not that easy because if her song lyrics are haram, then her singing the bad, wrong uh, lyrics will also be haram even among women, even among children, because the content is haram. So there is in love the, the content, the muhtawa, and the way it is done. So if it is accompanied with dancing and bad lyrics, and in front of men, then that's absolutely haram and totally prohibited. But it is lahu, it is some kind of fun. Nobody could deny this. But not all fun is halal fun. And 
I am sharing those distinctions because we all have kids and kids love to have fun and they label anything that is not fun as boring. So we, it is our responsibility to teach them that there are ways to have fun and enjoy yourself that is halal. Gymnastics as a body exercise of mobility and flexibility is a good fun to have, but presumably that you cover your aura and you don't do any motions that are luring or meant to signify or signal uh, bad negative signals that people should not. So there are lots of activities that is halal, but unfortunately the, the society here which offers you halal and haram things most of the time mixed together, uh, they need an open eye and an informed mind so that we choose what is halal and what is not, and what verges between the two, okay? So the word al and the word lahu are related to each other, which point to what is fun, enjoyable, pleasant, and makes you feel happy, lahu. Uh, we spoke about music before, so I will not repeat the issue of music because it becomes, by children's standard, it becomes boring that you talk about music so many times. So, but music, uh, general rule is, Muslim scholars said that not all instruments are halal. They allow what is called a duf, which is played with one hand and held by the other. And it is allowed for occasions. So one should not take this as a profession and make money out of this as if it is a profession. It is a matter of play. So we need to distinguish between earning our living from sources that can be productive and beneficial for the society and those who consume it, and between playing so that people can enjoy it and then I make money out of their joy. This is not a, a profession. Uh, this is law and it should be limited to that, which is just to have fun, that's okay. But not all instruments, again, are okay or halal. This is about law. al hakum means distracted you. What? It is the takathur. You've been bragging about piling wealth and accumulating power and making name and making fame for yourself, for your tribe, for your family. And as if the ayah is saying, what a waste of life. Because it doesn't say, don't do lahu, don't play this or that. It says, it distracted you. What did it distract us from? It really doesn't say, it really doesn't. And why wouldn't the Quran say, this piling and bragging has distracted you from A, B, C, because it's obvious what it does distract us from. It distracts us from doing what we have to do. So for example, if you are engaged in a game on computer or laptop or anything else uh, with some friends and they are over the internet somewhere else. But at your time, when the event calls, you just drop the game and go for wudu and go for salah because playing should not distract me from responding to Allah when He calls. The Quran says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اِسْتَجِيبُوا لِلَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ Respond to Allah and to His Messenger whenever He calls you to that which gives you life. Does Allah call us for anything except that which gives us life? He only calls us for the most important things to do. 
Some people think that Allah only calls us to prayer. This is the only call they know. But Allah calls us for justice. He calls us to stand against tyranny. He calls us to stand united. He calls us to learn our deen. He calls us to make da'wah and reach out with our deen to others. He calls us to apply our deen in our life. So there's a lot of calls coming from heaven for anyone who wants to benefit. So whatever Allah calls us to do, it is for our benefit. Even when he takes our money, it is for our benefit. Whatever you spend in the path of Allah, it is for your own souls. Fali an fusikum. It's very important. Why does Allah point out to us what distracts us? And then He points us to what benefits us. So that we avoid distracting ourselves and so that our life is all full of benefits. What does the Quran define as beneficial? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that this life in comparison to the latter life is like zero compared to infinity. Which means full. When you're full, you cannot take any more. So when this life, the other life, is called al hayawan it means it is the only life that is full of life as life is at its best. See the word, one word in Arabic carries lots of sentences in English. It's not easy. It's not easy to express something as great as the hereafter life in one word. But Allah captures it saying, this is the only life that is full of life, that is worthy of the name life, and it is full of what life should be when it is at its best. In contrast to what to this life, full of miseries, full of trouble, full of pain, full of suffering that we most of the time impose on ourselves or impose on others. Right? So Allah saying, look at this. And look at this, what are you playing? What are you doing? So al hakm al-Takathur starts off with an alarm, a signal. It's like, you hear the fire truck when it comes close? This is the fire truck in front of your house. Telling you, you are wasting your time. And by wasting your time, you are wasting your life. Because what is life? It comes in increments of time. One day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one breath at a time, and it's finished. So, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur is a stark alarm bell that is coming from Allah to tell us that what you are wasting your time enjoying yourself Yes, you are enjoying yourself, but you are not building neither credit in the hereafter, nor benefit in this life. So anything, by, by extra, extrapolation, anything that does not benefit you, one of two benefits, either something tangible in this life, or something in the hereafter, then it is a waste of our life. Al-Hakum al-Takathur The mutual rivalry of bragging about piling of wealth, power or positions has distracted you. Stop. He doesn't say from what. But he is, the focus here is what is a distraction? It is something that you enjoy doing even though money is of benefit. 
But bragging about money is a waste of money and benefit. Because as it comes, it can easily go. Right? Like, I'm stronger. Health can also come and it can go. So bragging is useless. It's harmful. It only inflates what is ego and it nurtures arrogance, which is counter to our faith. Faith and arrogance cannot settle in one and the same heart. So alhaqum al-takathur. So what does it distract us from? From anything that is beneficial, anything in which we please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that also means the distractions, especially if they are haram. And now, Allah is not saying that those lahu are all haram, as I mentioned in the beginning. But, but the ayah is not talking about only what's haram. It's talking about lahu in general. It takes time from what is good. So Muslim scholars have given a good guidance in this. They say, وَنَفْسُكَ إِنْ لَمْ تَشْغَلْهَا بِالْحَقِّ شَغَلَتْكَ بِالْبَاطِلِ If you don't get yourself busy doing something to serve the truth you believe in, and the truth that makes life just easy and simple and peaceful, then you are wasting your life. And what's more dangerous is your nafs, your soul, will drag you to do something harmful. The least harm is wasting your time. So this concept creates a lot of discussion, especially from our kids. They say, is it haram to play cards? Is it haram to do music? Is it haram to dance? Is it haram to this? And we waste our time by trying to trace their questions. And I'm not saying don't answer them, but give them one answer that makes it easy. Do you have something better to use your life for? Is this what your life is worth? Is this what you think Allah has created you for? If the answer is no, do what Allah has created you for, and when you're finished, then you can enjoy yourself. Let's take music as one of those things. We know that music is mostly used for partying, right? And for people so staying to relax and hear some classics and so on and so forth. But this could have been time for dhikr. This could have been time to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This could have been time to praise Allah and increase my hasanat. So the time I use for myself is wasted. But the time I use to please Allah or to benefit myself, to achieve something beneficial, is good. So by that standard, if we give the standard to our kids, they are inshallah smart to make good judgments. But we need to give them the standard by which we judge. And I'm hoping that this is not only a message for us adults, but also that it should go for our children and grandchildren for that matter. So, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur. So, we think, and our children in particular think, that Lahu is not only good, but it is needed. And uh, some, of the, some adults also cite the Prophet Sallallahu who says, you know, Sa'atun wa sa'a, one hour be serious and one hour have fun, right? But here is the catch. The next ayah says, حَتَّى This distraction continued to drag you on until your time came to go to your grave. Which means we could waste literally our entire life tracking what is fun, watching a movie, watching play game, 
watching the news that people fabricate to discover later on it was fabricated. Reading a story that someone wrote but we find out it was fake. Or reading some parts in science that we discover later it was false science. So there's a lot of serious things that we do that waste our time. When we add only what is funny and pleasant and joyful for our desires, then we are expanding the area and the time consumed to be wasted until we get to uh, our end. Mind you that we have seen on TV, I have seen on TV, people who are being called artists and this and this, who die on the stage. What did they do their entire life on the stage? Is it not a wasted life? It is a wasted life. But if from time to time I take time out to walk in a garden, looking at flowers and trees and the nature, if I walk into a museum so that I learn how things are made or what is the history of uh, the biological life on Earth or the Airspace Museum, we live in a town of museums all around us. That enjoyment is informative and enjoyment at the same time. This is maximizing the benefit. You enjoy what you learn about and you benefit from learning about any of those subjects, whether it is the Museum of Natural History, the Museum of Aerospace, or whatever museum that you like, they are meant to give you a relaxed time. There is no duty, there is no deadline, there is nobody standing on your back to enjoy yourself and benefit at the same time. So Islam is not tightening life or making it smaller. No. Islam wants to give us the maximum benefit from this life by pointing us to what could distract us. So if you're traveling in a train or car and it says scenery or something coming up, right? But you were reading a book, right? You will miss the scenery, right? but everybody else will enjoy it, who looks outside the window, right? So, as such, when you are wasting your life, some people other than yourself are using the life differently and they are benefiting from it, okay? So from time to time, to look at something beautiful, to appreciate nature, to look at the birds and their life, or the cats, or the snakes, or the animals, or fish or anything else, Allah tells us, look around you. That's his invitation. But he is telling, look at this to appreciate what Allah has created. To appreciate his power of creation. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one more thing to say, and I will shut this issue. Uh, we could enjoy everything in life if we decided to. Don't you know people who enjoy reading more than anything else? Right? We could be like them. But we don't have to go extreme. Life is not just about reading. Life is also about walking and seeing things as I mentioned. Right? But if we decided to enjoy what is beneficial, this makes life absolutely fulfilling and helpful and easy. So do not focus your head on, but this is what I enjoy. Enjoy what Allah ordered you to do. Enjoy your prayer. Enjoy reading the Quran. Enjoy increasing your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enjoy the company of good people who don't use foul language, street words, profanities. That also is a joy. 
So joy is not what we define as artistic or fun or popular. Our joy is for us to decide what gives us joy. If it gives you joy to read the Quran, to memorize the Quran, use it. If it makes you uh, joyful to play with your peers, play with them. But don't play something that can waste your time or hurt your body. Like, I would say, violent games are not something that anybody should say, I enjoy it. To break somebody's neck in wrestling, for example, is not, it shouldn't be an allowed source of joy. It shouldn't be. Because we're not supposed to kill each other for nothing. What is this belt that I end up taking? It's nothing. So I'm just giving examples quickly so that we have a perspective to look through to determine what is halal and what is not, what is acceptable and what's not. So it says, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur, that piling wealth has distracted you until you visited the graves Hatta zurtum al-naqabr Why is the Qur'an calling burying somebody into the grave as a visit? Because when you visit somebody you stay for a cup of tea maybe for dinner, right? Unless you plan to move in with him, right? So even death Allah is referring to as a temporary visit. You see, there are people in their graves for thousands of years, right? They are not up yet. And Allah is calling all of this period a visit, implying its shortness. And that's why the Quran, to further uh, signify this fact that that, that the years, the centuries that we spend in the grave are only short periods. When, when they are asked after resurrection, how long have you stayed in your grave? They would say, we stayed maybe a day, maybe part of a day. Imagine somebody in their grave for thousands of years, but for them, it is like maybe part of a day or maximum a day. We love to live long, right? And we don't love to die long. So Allah makes this life feel so long, right? And the result is we love to make it longer than what he allows, right? But we're not improving. The longer we live, the more of the same mistakes we keep practicing. So Allah is saying, mind you, you will spend a lot of time, especially those of us who love to sleep. There will be time when you'll be sleeping for centuries so don't try to waste this life sleeping. <laughs> Some people have their fun when they go to bed. That's their fun. The minute they finish their business and their body aches start to pain them, they want some comfort and they want it long. But Allah made this life different than our framing. It cannot be reshaped. You sleep, but there's so long you could sleep. How long does the longest one sleep in this life? I read some stories several years ago that some people slept for seven days. And I don't know what the <laughs> Genesis Book of Records will have, but it's amazing that somebody would sleep seven days and how couldn't he wake up? So, 
when Allah says حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرِ until you visited the grave and that also implies until you visited the grave you did not recognize the wasteful activities you have consumed your life doing until you come to the grave you say oh I wish I had done this and the Prophet ﷺ actually speaks to that he says لا يموت ميت إلا ندما every dying person will die in regret if he has done bad he would regret not having done good and if he had done good he would regret that he had not done better or more so everyone will die in regret why regret? why don't we do it now? there is a book that somebody pointed to me one time but I didn't get a chance to read it the title is amazing it says die empty die empty what is die empty? the premise of the book is that everybody dies with ideas he never translated into actions or benefits things that came to him from Allah or from a friend or from a family member that he did not turn those ideas into benefit and he did not even write it down for others to benefit from it what a waste and it is all of us unfortunately sometimes ideas come and you want to do it but then comes a phone call here, a message here, a task here, an assignment there and the day is gone and the idea is flushed out so die empty wants to tell us a message do not leave anything good go with you in the grave without manifesting it without materializing it in your life don't die full of good things but in your head not in your life very good title very good title I wish I wish is one of those dying empty counter concept that you wish to do things but you never get to do it so حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ until you visit the graves is kind of like a signal between this life and the life after once we get to the grave there is nothing with us no money no power no friends no family no opportunities no, no jobs nothing but before death you have all of this how do you make it into something good for you it's all up to every person so these two ayah are focusing on this issue the man wrote about 700 pages to give us this concept Allah is giving us for free in two lines الْهَابُ مُتَّكَاثُرُ حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ also the concept of visiting the grave because we all wish that going to the grave is only a visit that I go see the hereafter a bit of it and then I come back to correct myself no there is no return back, no U-turn the grave is a one-way spot that you do not want to reach it in regret may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conclude our life with our best then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strikes us with a correction when the Quran says kalla it means it is not what you think it is not what you think or it is not what you assume or it is not what you wish as Allah says clearly in the Quran 
ليس بأمانيكم ولا أماني أهل الكتاب من يعمل سوءا يجز به. It is not up to your wishful thinking or the wishful thinking of the people of the book. Anyone who does something bad, he will be recompensated exactly for what they have done. كلا سوف تعلمون you shall definitely come to know. ثم كلا سوف تعلمون. This is double attention drawing linguistic method. When I say كلا ثم كلا, that is to attract your attention. Something important is coming. ثم كلا سوف تعلمون. Then again, nay, you shall come to know. And then to know what? It doesn't say. But definitely to know what you have done and to know the value of what we have told you. It's a nice way. It's not a rebuke. It is a nice way to draw somebody's attention when you tell him, I told you so. Even though culturally it is offensive, but as a benefit, it is a strong reminder that when you hear me talking, try to pick the benefit. Don't focus on whatever words I use, whatever words I stumble on. Use what's beneficial. Filter what you hear. Sometimes we focus on the noise and leave the music to play out away from us. The benefit is in the content of what you hear, not in the physiology. Even though we are instructed to speak our best, but not all of us are successful with that. So when somebody fights with you, why did you do this? You did this. Don't be distracted by the noise. Focus on the benefit. What lesson is he teaching you? What lesson could you pick? from this kind of discussion. ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Nay, you shall certainly come to know. كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ It is the third way of emphasizing that there are things to know that are very important, that we must dig, we must study, we must know, we must pay attention to. كَلَّا لو تعلمون علم اليقين Nay, if you only knew the sure knowledge sure means certain has no doubt that death is the end of this life but it is not the end of the whole life it is the beginning of the real life it's a bridge between this life and eternal life so take it for what it is. Make yourself ready. Don't waste your life piling this and piling that and bragging this and bragging that. Don't waste your life. Nay, there shall come time when you know what is certain to know and will certainly be clearly known to you which means things that are beyond our worldly life. The only constant in this life is change. One day you wake up happy and active and engaging. Another day you are lazy, you feel down, right? You go out of your home active and optimistic and life is opening for you this is my best day, then something happens to turn it around. Or the opposite. You think it's the worst job you've ever had, but once you get the job and you get to train and you get to learn it, you love it, it becomes your best opportunity. So in this life, do not focus. This life teaches us not to ever focus on the moment. 
Why? Because the moment is full of distractions. The shaitan is coming from here, your desires are coming from within, and people around you, whether it is your family or neighbors or anybody else, they also want you to pay attention to them. So, if you forget yourself and forget your family and pay attention to everybody else, you're wasting your life. And if you exclusively work for your family and forget your community and the environment in which you live, you're also wasting your life. Everybody has certain rights on it and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is very remarkable on this issue. Inna lirabbika alayka haqqa Your Lord has certain rights on you. Wa inna li badanika alayka haqqa Your body has certain rights upon you. Wa inna li nafsika alayka haqqa Your soul has certain rights on you. وَإِنَّ لِأَهْلِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Your family. وَإِنَّ لِزَوْرِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Your guest and your neighbor. You count it and it's extensive. And then he says فَأَعْطِ كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقَّ The balanced life is to give everybody no more but no less than the right. So when we were all teenagers, our friends became more important than our families. And there is a good reason for this. Family, for every child, makes laws, regulations, restrictions. And at that age, everybody wants more freedom. Our friends do not always guide us and say, this is haram, this is halal. So they allow us more freedom. So together, we can make something that I cannot do in front of my family. So I love my friends more than my family. But is this in my best interest? No. I should give my family their dues and I should give my friend their dues. I should have a balance so that none will grab me away from the center of gravity, away from my principles, away from my deen, away from my values. So what will happen when we see the hereafter? لترون الجحيم When when you get the yaqeen knowledge, the knowledge of certainty, you will see paradise with your eyes in your grave. And if you are that forbid on the other side, people on the other side will see hellfire with their own eyes. It's not a pleasant place to be unless you have advanced good credit, not bad credit. لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ You will most certainly then see the blazing fire. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينِ I want to talk about علم اليقين وعين اليقين. علم اليقين is knowledge that cannot be uh, counter-indicated, which means it cannot take you wrong. It is certain, it's clear, it's evident. That's the knowledge of yaqeen. Yaqeen means certainty. So I cannot trust something that is changeable. So everything that I hear in this life is subject to change. We said the only constant in life is change. You like the daytime, but night has to come, right? Yes. You like the night time because it's rest time, it is relaxation, right? But the daytime has to come. So nothing is constant in this life. Even our relationship with Allah, our faith in Allah is not constant. Maybe only in its essence it's constant. Right? A Muslim who is at the same time sane and wise should never lose faith. Right? But faith itself, there are points where it increases, it becomes very strong, and there are low points when we don't feel the strength of our faith. We have to be honest, we have to address those issues. Allahumma ameen. 
So there is علم اليقين the knowledge of certainty okay and part of the knowledge of certainty is the knowledge we get from the Quran the knowledge that we get from authentic proven sunnah okay and also part of it is the knowledge we acquire in this life about this life that has stood the test of time it has been known for hundreds of years or something like this it cannot be uh, countered by something opposite it is not a theory it is definitive final science on the subject even though science itself is always subject to new discoveries and counterindications wrong interpretation misapplication but science in general is as close to scientific facts are close to what is constant more than it is to what is constantly changing opinions are more changeable than anything else I myself talk against my talk yesterday the day after so we all recognize those phenomena so we need to understand what is fixed and constant to clutch to and what is changeable that we don't have a fight over it will change so where the Quran calls the certainty of sight عين اليقين is when something you see with your own eyes it is difficult not to be certain as to what you're seeing unless you are lo looking at magic because magicians play with our eyesight but there are magicians that try to play with our insight and those are more dangerous because they want to manipulate our hearts the ones who want to play with our eyes they want us to misjudge something for what it is not right so then on that day you will be asked about what? and naeem what is naeem? the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can we count his blessings? can we then thank him for his blessings that we cannot count? can we pay him back for any of his blessings? is there any of his blessings that's minimal? is there any of his blessings that we can do away with? then mind those blessings while you are here before you move there because all of those blessings will be put on the scale it is said that a man came on the day of judgment and Allah asked him do you want to enter paradise by your good works or just by my grace and the man certain of his good righteous deeds for all of his life he says oh no my my good works so Allah SWT tells the angels to take one of his eyes and put it on the scale on one side and to put all of his good deeds on the other side of the scale and his eye tip the balance so he asked him again do you want to come in paradise with my grace or by your good deeds? he said no no your grace and the Prophet ﷺ himself uh, summarizes this in a hadith he says لا يدخل الجنة أحد بعملي no one will enter paradise just by the weight and the value of his deeds they said even you Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he says yes even me unless Allah covers me in his grace إلا أن يتغمدني الله برحمته سبحان الله ثم لا تسألنا يومئذ عن النعيم this is the last ayah 
and then he will be asked about the Naim. So the destruction, apparently from the totality of the surah, was a destruction from being grateful to Allah for the blessings he has given us. And using those blessings to benefit us in this life and in the hereafter, we just use them to have fun, wasting the entire life. And then when we come on the Day of Judgment and we are asking about the Naim, the blessings, the hands, the legs, the air we breathe, the hair, everything. How do we answer? How do we say, oh Allah, yes, we recognize this is all yours. But in this life, if you did not offer gratitude for those gifts, how could you then spare that gratitude for the day of judgment? It doesn't work this way. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all grateful for all of his blessings and to make us appreciative of his gifts and to enable us to not waste our life for anything that does not pay off for our hereafter. We have eight minutes to the Iqama if you have a couple of questions. Okay, it's a good question. The question is, you mentioned that people, when they are resurrected out of their graves, they would feel that the time they spent is so short, which means there was no grave torment, no trouble in the grave, uh, that it was short. Well, people will feel the same about this life also. Is this life pleasant? Not always, likewise. <laughs> so our impression of time does not necessarily reflect the pleasure we had. The issue of Adab al-Qabr is a very involving issue. I cannot answer it in one minute or two. But if you want, come next Friday and inshallah we'll give it time. Okay? But it is proven in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is torment in the grave. This is part of the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. The Aqeedah of Muslims who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that the grave is either a place of paradise or a place of hell. Otherwise, why is it that Allah SWT made a system that the Prophet taught us that we should not bury a Muslim in a non-Muslim cemetery because he will be troubled by the screaming of his neighbors. Okay? So inshallah next week we'll do that. Subhanakallahumma hamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayka.